But yeah, look, Elon's got a huge audience. And so, um, you know, the work that he's doing in monkeys probably gets more attention than the work that we've already done in humans. So that is uh, certainly frustrating. But as long as we continue to generate compelling data, I think eventually we will be able to show the power of our approach. Welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO Interviews, informed conversations with the best and brightest CEOs in the publicly traded markets. Quality of leadership is a decisive factor in stock performance. Our show provides intimate and in-depth investing discussions with industry leaders across all sectors of the marketplace. We publish excerpts on social media platforms and the full conversations on SeekingAlpha.com or on our highly rated Seeking Alpha mobile app under CEO Interviews. Welcome back to Seeking Alpha. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst, and today, interviewing CEOs. My guest today is Brian Cooley. He is the CEO of Lineage Cell Therapeutics. You can find him on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol LTCX. Brian, thanks for being with us at CEO Interviews. Hi, Josh. Nice to be here today. Appreciate it. Uh, for those that don't know, I always like to ask the question about what you do, what your company is. Maybe you could just dive in a little bit for those who are unaware of Lineage Cell Therapeutics. What it is, what is it that you guys do? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Uh, just being a public company, I just want to mention that uh, people can learn more about our risk factors and uh, review our filings through the sec.gov. So Lineage Cell Therapeutics is uh, a regenerative medicine cell therapy company. So what I mean by that is that we have a technology that allows us to manufacture specific cell types, and then we transplant those to the body and we effectively use those as the medicine. So for example, if you have a particular cell type, uh, such as you know, part of your retina, uh, we can manufacture those retina cells and replace them and help people who have a certain kind of vision loss. So it, it is a cell therapy regen med company. So you guys are pioneering kind of a, a new branch of medicine with your, your cell transplant approach in order to restore and improve function. It's been lost due to aging or injury or disease. So you guys are producing a specific type of human cell and stably transplant those cells as treatment for serious medical conditions. Can you explain to somebody like me who's not really aware of, I know stem cell transplants in the U.S., uh, with like umbilical cords or something like that is not legal. And then there's platelet rich plasma or PRP. Can you kind of maybe uh, distinguish what you do versus what those uh, procedures are? Yeah, I'm really glad that you started there because um, that is a whole sort of branch of cell therapy that is still sort of, um, you know, in testing and, and questionable. And occasionally you get some bad actors over on that side of it that are literally exploiting people uh, who are required to, to pay a tremendous amount of money to get access to these untested therapies. Uh, we're operating right in the middle of a highly regulated, FDA regulated and ethical environment. So we are doing traditional new therapeutic development, call it drug development. It's just different because our drugs happen to be a bunch of cells instead of a small molecule or an antibody. So what we are delivering is not stem cells, to be really clear about something that's important here. Uh, stem cells may have a, a purpose and a function in certain settings. We use stem cells just as starting material to manufacture the actual cell that your body needs. So just like a uh, flower can become a cookie or it can become bread, uh, stem cells have the ability to become other types of cells, literally every cell in your body. So that's how uh, our approach is different. Our approach is more like um, more like a bone marrow transplant, where you actually are taking the, the final product and transplanting it into an individual, rather than stem cells that go into an individual and they, they float around and no one's really exactly sure what they do and where they go yet. Uh, so we, we think of it more like transplant medicine, which has greater ability to, to regulate and control what happens in the body. What are the advantages of the cell transplant approach over a traditional drug approach developed by competitors that are requiring kind of monthly or semi-monthly injections? Yeah, so um, typically in the setting of drug development, what a, a bunch of scientists will do is there'll be some biological pathway. There's something wrong in a cell. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll screen literally millions of different compounds to try and find something that helps uh, either increase the activity 
of that cell or decrease the activity of that cell. But they're really ta talking about targeted approaches, very narrow, focused on one little piece of the cell that's broken. What we do is we replace the entire cell. By replacing the entire cell, you actually can be indifferent to what's going wrong on the inside. And so we find that our approach has the opportunity to provide uh, more, let's say, horsepower than some of the more traditional approaches. So to kind of bring it down to an analogy I like, if you're trying to get somewhere in your vehicle and it will not start, you don't know if it's the battery, there's no gas, maybe the tires are flat. There's a thousand reasons why your car might not start. And traditional medicine would be, well, I'm just gonna replace the battery. That's all you do is battery, battery, battery. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do is we give you the whole new car because we don't have time to figure out what's wrong. Maybe it's not known what's wrong but you have to get somewhere. So by transplanting an entirely new replacement cell, we think we can do a much better job of picking up whatever the problem is that happens to be going on inside of that cell. I wanna ask you a question about uh, people's requests. Do you get anybody who wants a specific type of cell or genetics and can you, can you really dive in that deep? So if somebody wants to, you know, if, if they have an injury and they want the genetics of a bodybuilder or something, or let's say with uh, the vaccines, there's people who are afraid of, of what's in that and they don't want um, cells from people who have AIDS. They don't want cells from people who have autoimmune diseases. They don't want cells from people who have a vaccine. Are you getting those requests and are you able to filter that? Well, one of the things that we keep very near and dear, of course, is the, the protection of, of uh, the source of the cells, but the cells are extensively well characterized. Uh, and the safety data that we've collected to date has been compelling. People have not been rejecting these transplants. Um, we are currently in clinical trials for three approaches. So we're making a retina cell to help with a major cause of vision loss. We're making a spinal cord cell that helps people recover mobility after a spinal cord injury. And we also manufacture one of the cells of the immune system that can be useful in treating cancer. We're not yet at the point where we can manufacture all 200 different cell types of the body, but I think ultimately that's where this technology will be headed. The requests that I get tend to be from people who have conditions that we're doing clinical testing in. So I have received, uh, individually, I've received calls from people who have tri-age-related macular degeneration, or I've received calls from parents of, of kids who've suffered spinal cord injuries and, the, and these kids are paralyzed. So yeah, we do get those incoming calls because we're working in this space and, and we have the robustness of an FDA-cleared um, clinical trial that we're, that we're conducting. Um, but in terms of designer babies and, and all that sort of stuff, we don't operate in that space. But, um, you know, that's part of the technology that, you know, there always will be someone working in that area. Elon Musk is working on some uh, interesting, you know, some people might think bizarre stuff. Neuralink is, is one of those interesting things. Uh, you mentioned spinal cord injuries. And I'm wondering, uh, is that going to be on its own to have the ability to get people to walk again, or will you be working with uh, like an AI assisted mechanical mobility feature? Yeah, it's certainly the the objective to get people as much mobility and, and walking is, is clearly that. I, I know that Elon, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, said that <clears throat> he hoped that they could get patients to be able to start typing 40 words a minute after suffering a, a you know, paraplegic or <clears throat> quadriplegic uh, injury. And I, I sort of chuckled and, and thought, well, we've already done that. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's still working on monkeys. And we actually have a young man who was, uh, who was a, a quadriplegic and he went through our clinical trial and he has a, a very fulsome life now. And, and he does have the ability to type 35, 40 words a minute. So um, how our approach can be combined with our other approaches, I think is one of the advantages. So what we do is we transplant these replacement spinal cord cells about three to six weeks after the injury. So there's a little bit of time there for the injury to settle down before our cells get delivered. 
And then thereafter, if that individual is going to be doing physical therapy or they're going to you know, gain access to one of those exoskeletons that are, that are really cool that people work on or uh, receive electrostimulation, I think all of those technologies are additive and helpful. If you imagine putting in new material as we do, that material being stimulated electrically or physically we imagine could only be beneficial and it's not a prohibition. It, it probably would work better with our stuff. So uh, yeah, we think that those other approaches are great. I would imagine it's gotta be kind of frustrating to see Tesla stock and, and where it's at when Elon's been promising, you know, Neuralink and promising uh, level five autonomous driving and we're still not there and you are past monkeys and yet um, people might not have, have heard of you. So it's, it's gotta be a little bit frustrating. Do you consider Neuralink a competitor? And can maybe you explain some strategic advantages that you have over the competition? Yeah, I think anyone who's working on uh, improving mobility after a spinal cord injury is in a way a competitor. Now, many of these, I think, are more likely to be complementers than competitors. But yeah, look, Elon's got a huge audience. And so, um, you know, the work that he's doing in monkeys probably gets more attention than the work that we've already done in humans. So that is uh, certainly frustrating. But as long as we continue to generate compelling data, I think eventually we will be able to show the power of our approach. Talk to me about your potential partnerships. Lineage, you guys have been involved in a couple of partnerships already. You have cancer research in the UK uh, with partnerships. You guys have shown interest in other areas to generate valuable progress in advancing three of your clinical programs and further strengthening your company's capabilities and speaking about um, opening up large number of potential corporate partnerships by allowing you guys to um, use... Uh, well, I'm just going to stop right there and I'll let you, because there's a quote here and I actually want you to say it. So um, talk to me just about your potential partnerships uh, and the success that you've had without financial burdens of independent developments. So Lineage is one of a very small number of companies that has secured a corporate partnership with a major pharmaceutical company. So our lead program for uh, leading cause of vision loss was partnered recently with Roche and Genentech. And that was in a deal that was valued at up to $670 million and included a $50 million upfront payment. So in the, the universe of cell therapy companies, we, we sort of stand out. We're distinguished by the fact that we were able to attract a global pharmaceutical company with all of their expertise in ophthalmology. And so we'll be collaborating them uh, with them on that program. So partnership is, partnerships are important to us. They can bring cash, they can bring credibility, they can bring capabilities. Um, what we try to do is find the right time to enter into partnerships. We may hold on to some of our other assets for longer. We may elect to enter into partnerships if they're good for our shareholders, like the one that we just announced. Uh, but it really is, is validating, I believe, to, uh, even today, that it's the largest non-cancer cell therapy deal ever done is, is the one that we did with Roche and Genentech. So we're very proud of that uh, that was announced last December. Do you have any uh, near-term M&A plans? You guys had an exclusive option to the privately held Amass Therapeutics. Uh, anything else in the works that you can talk about? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, never, never anything I can talk about. Um, you know, we're always open to conversations for acquiring new technology or enabling our programs to, to move forward and farther and faster in the hands of others. Um, and so, yeah, we, we always like to have those conversations because those conversations provide optionality and optionality can provide value. So it's always something that's sort of on the horizon for us. You guys were talking with the FDA, and I always find that fascinating because it's a really expensive conversation and it takes forever. So you guys have been involved in a lot of interactions with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. You guys have been discussing product designation, manufacturing plans, late stage clinical developments. So you have two FDA approved therapies for the less common uh, wet AMD. Um, so that has a market of, of more than 10 billion. And there's no approved treatments yet for dry AMD. What is that and what's the update? Yeah, the amazing thing there is that, um, and this goes back to what you had asked me about a, a moment ago. So there's two forms of age-related macular degeneration. They're called wet and dry. The wet form is really well understood. Scientists have figured out what's broken. So going back to that car analogy, they knew 
that the battery was dead. So we replaced batteries in the setting of wet AMD. And that it actually is a more than $10 billion uh, sales uh, um, uh, product today. It's not our product, it's product held by other companies. Um, but it, what's different is that dry AMD, despite being eight to nine times more common, there is nothing approved in dry AMD. And I think the reason is that we don't understand what's going wrong. We don't really have the ability to put our finger and say, oh, it's the battery in the car. It's something broken. That's all we know. And so there's this incredibly large commercial opportunity for whichever company or companies are able to unlock this riddle and figure out how to develop a new therapy. We think that we're on to something very compelling in the setting of dry AMD because we've shown data that no other company has generated. And that is we've shown something called retinal restoration. So we were actually able to get areas of the retina that previously were uh, devoid of tissue or they had uh, degenerated. We were able to rescue them or restore them. And that's something that no other approach has been able to do. Let's talk about your revenues. Uh, you're doing some interesting things and yet uh, revenue slipped last quarter. But for the first three quarters ending September 30th, you guys had 2.3 million in revenues, an increase of 1.7 compared to the 600,000 you had for the same period in 2020. What was the uh, reason for the 25% dip in revenue for the fourth quarter? And what are some of the biggest drivers of your revenue growth for the next few years? Yeah, the revenues are very fluctuating in a, in a biotech company. They're often driven through partnerships uh, or grants and, and these things ebb and flow. It's not like selling... Um, uh, you know, a widget that, that you can grow a few percent quarter over quarter. So really what we are providing shareholders is an opportunity to uh, enjoy future revenues in the healthcare space, which, you know, can reach into the billions of dollars. So we don't worry so much on a quarterly or even an annual basis about our revenue. What's important for us is to maintain a long runway, a multi-year runway, of access to capital so that we can continue to run our studies, generate more and more convincing data. Uh, ultimately, when these products do get to FDA approval and then they are launched, that's when you typically would enjoy uh, the significant revenue that many of these products are able to achieve. There's been a significant um, impact with the global economy, shipping, supply chains, uh, being in that kind of P PPE world to a certain extent. How have you had to deal with that? Have, have you and or your partners been impacted by supply constraints and how have you dealt with that? Yeah, we, um, we took it very seriously early on, we, we understood, uh, you know, look, you've got a company filled with scientists, right? We, we understand the threat of, of global pandemics. So one of the acts that we took upon ourselves was to do a lot of pre-purchasing of critical materials, uh, reagents and, and such that maybe would not be easily available. Uh, we also have facilities uh, around the world. And so we can do purchasing through different international sources and, and routes. So if, uh, you know, if we need a, if we need a reagent and um, it's difficult to purchase it in the U S maybe our manufacturing facility in Israel can get it, uh, or maybe they can get it cheaper and so forth. So I think just being ahead of the game, being able to make sure that you have uh, availability and you have a long runway to be able to plan for that sort of thing really does help a company. Now, companies that are running clinical trials like ours, if you have clinical trial sites, i.e. hospitals and, and centers that are enrolling patients in countries or regions for which there is some disruption. So for example, if you're enrolling patients in Ukraine, you're going to have a problem. Uh, that's not a problem that affects us specifically, but it is illustrative of the importance of having a large number of clinical centers spread out across the globe so that you can maintain an, an undisrupted supply line of patients and data. Lineage, you guys are clearly working on becoming a leader in cell therapy and cell transplant, transplant medicine. What do you think, though, Brian, is the biggest aspect of your business or the most important for investors to understand? Well, I think a lot of investors, maybe every investor, has some awareness of cell therapy. Um, but I think what's really exciting about Lineage is we're taking some of the promises that were made a decade ago 
And we're actually starting to turn them into clinical reality. We're actually starting to show that there are medicines now that can change people's lives. We've got these wonderful patient testimonials, these videos of people talking about how their, their vision has improved. I mean, that's really exciting because it's long been thought that self-therapy could benefit a huge number of people, but it's just taken this, this industry a long time to mature. And I think we're one of the emerging leaders in the group of companies that are starting to really push this technology forward so that it can reach the patient's bedside, so that it can get to the physician's armamentarium, and so that people can really enjoy that there are new medicines out there to treat these diseases that don't have other cures or options. What are your thoughts on the future of the industry? So you guys are believing the field of cell therapy is poised for explosive growth, but what does that mean for the future of the industry? What does it look like for 2023 and beyond? Well, that's a very, um, I can answer that from a very personal perspective. Uh, Many years ago, I used to work in orphan diseases or rare diseases before they really became, frankly, a big deal. Um, And it was amazing for me to see the explosive growth in areas that people had previously neglected. So everyone's focused on cancer and everyone's focused on heart disease, but there are some diseases out there that provided some new medicines and breakthroughs. And it was incredible to see that whole field of rare and orphan diseases explode. I think we're seeing the same thing now. Uh, The hallmarks of explosive growth in cell therapy tend to be uh, capital commitments, and clinical progress. And and those two categories are moving up and to the right. So cell and gene therapy as a whole discipline is really maturing and growing very serious money in terms of the amounts and the people who are behind that money are coming into it. And I think that's indicative of the explosive growth. And I want to make sure we're a part of that. That It's a really exciting place to be. Where can they find you at? Are you on uh, social media at all or website? <laughs> Obviously, you're on New York Stock Exchange or the ticker symbol LCTX, but where else are you at? Yeah, so um, we we actually are a little bit unusual that uh, I think the company is is very engaged with, with shareholders. Um, personally, I do uh, keep a, a, a Twitter channel open. That's at CEO underscore Cully. Um, but also our, our corporate uh, Twitter and social uh, channels are, are available. Um, we even sometimes have made our own sort of homegrown videos and put them out there. It's actually a fun tool because not everything needs to come in a sterile press release. Sometimes you just want to communicate some context or some information. You say, why do I have to do this in a press release? Maybe it's not important enough for a press release, but it's important enough that people would like to know it. So we really try to be active on social media and, and in other channels that provide people with an opportunity to, uh, we invite them to come learn more about lineage. Uh, We're accessible. We we respond to people as often as we can. And we really try and help people join us on this journey to develop new medicines in this new branch of medicine. All right. With that, I think we're going to have to wrap this one up. I want to thank my guest, Brian Coley. He's the CEO of Lineage Cell Therapeutics. Brian, appreciate you being with us at Seeking Alpha. Thanks so much, Josh. I enjoyed it. Take care. Appreciate it. I'm Josh Kincaid. This has been another CEO interviews by Seeking Alpha. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks. Okay.